Amen. I like broken records, hence, therefore, I don't have a record player, but I like the idea that you used to be able to loop. I guess you can still loop a sound, right? Over and over again, pastor says, every Sunday, don't just attend church, be the church. Don't just attend a place once in a while, be the church of God. See, because we can't change the definitions of Scripture, even though we do, and once we change the definitions of Scripture, then we lost it. See, if the words no longer have meaning, then church becomes meaningless. Now, with this, studying 1 Corinthians and looking at this today, and I have a title. It's The Church and Involved and Committed Serving in Love. That's in 1 Corinthians 16. So when I talk about being the church, yes, I'm going to be talking to you today about your involvement and commitment unto Jesus Christ and to his bride, the church, the body of believers that is his. And you look around the room and, you know, maybe God could have picked a more beautiful group of people to get together. I don't know. I'm not saying you're ugly, right? <laughs> I looked in the mirror this morning. I'm aware of that. I, I try only to look once a day so I don't have to look more than once. Um, but, you know, God does not choose the mighty things of this world. In fact, he chooses the weak. God does not choose the... Uh, the wise things of this world, but he chooses the foolish that he may confound the wise of this age. Know that it, is, it has pleased God to save the such of uh, likes of you and us, uh, you and I, right? You and me, and I'll hack up the English language all day long. Man, I wish I could just communicate in math. It'd be so much easier. I'd give you numbers. <laughs> the uh, serving in love. Let's take a look at this today, 1 Corinthians 16. To those of you who study the Bible, you're like, oh, that's just the closing chapter. That's the throwaway chapter. We don't need that. Actually, we need it. See, when Paul signs off the letter and he wrote to the church, he says, now concerning the collection for the saints, can you believe it? Invite Sunday and the pastor's going to talk about giving. I mean, who puts these things together? I, oh, I just can't wait to talk about giving. I actually don't like talk about giving. But the scriptures, going right through the scriptures to understand what the Bible teaches, I didn't plan this ahead. We're in 1 Corinthians 16, the scriptures. Let's be faithful to draw out the meaning of the word of God. And let's look at this today. Now concerning the collection for the saints, as I have given orders to the churches of Galatia, so you must do also. On the first day of the week, let each one of you lay something aside. First day of the week is it's not Monday. It's Sunday. Why do we worship God on the first day of the week? Well, it's the eighth day, if you will. God created in six days, rested on the seventh. Seventh is the Sabbath. That's Shabbat. That's what we call Saturday, which that's a whole other story of how it gets named that. But Sunday is the eighth day. It's the day Jesus Christ rose from the dead. It's the day that the early church likewise recognized the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, and they worshiped on that day of new beginnings. And when you get saved and you're born again, isn't that what you really like? Don't don't you really like the, the new beginning? So it's day eight. But day one, first day of the week, their instructions were, lay each one of you, uh, each one of you lay a something aside, right? Put your money aside, storing up as he may prosper, that there may be no collections when I come. Now I like that. That's why we don't pass a plate here. Because of the fleecing of the body of Christ that has happened uh, in, in, in regards to giving, in regards to the passing of the plate, the pressures, the pledges, the perceptions of, hey, did this person give or not give? And you have an envelope and you're supposed to drop that in every week. And I grew up in that system. So by and large, you know, just walking in this, there is a way that you can give unto the Lord in this church. To, for the collection, here it says the collection of the saints. The uh, first day of the week, store it up. And then when I come, Paul says, whomever you approve by your letters, I will send... Um, I will send to bear your gift to Jerusalem, but if it is fitting that I, that I go also, they'll go with me. Let's take a look at this. Now, when we talk about why would you even give? So here they're giving to meet the needs of others. What a radical concept that you're saved by one Lord and you're bought at a price and you're no longer uh, he, your own, you're his, and he puts you into a body of believers and he says, look around now, love one another, care for one another. Get this, that we as a church walk in this, that if this is your church, there should be no unmet need in this body of believers because we can meet each other's needs. And through the course of this and having this understanding, it is about your involvement. Do you realize that to be a partaker of what happens in this ministry, not just to, to attend here on a Sunday morning, but to be a part of the church and to belong here, that we are actively fulfilling God's will and his call upon our lives as Calvary Chapel Fargo, a local representation of the body of Christ, to meet the needs of everyone who comes here and then the needs of those others that God shows us that we're to care for their needs. 
We have a benevolence program. We have a way to meet the needs within this body of believers. And I only say it so you can see these words are not empty, but they're applied here where you go. Now, you may not be a partaker of this ministry. You may be on the outside looking in. You may be attending today. You may be wondering what makes this whole thing work. It's about your involvement. As Paul talks to the church at Corinth, he talks about their involvement with the body of Christ. And it does involve your giving. Now, praise the Lord that we can walk in this because it also involves another word, your commitment. The word that nobody wants to even pay attention to anymore. I'm guessing my wife is very glad that the word commitment means something, all right? And I'm pretty sure that you as a church are pretty glad that I have a commitment. And here we are in this commitment looking at this. It, it took some effort that they did what? First day of the week, right? Do you set aside your first fruits that belong unto the Lord and say, as I may prosper? Keep in mind, everything the scripture says about giving, you have the tithe in the Old Testament. I still teach the tithe because I believe that the grace of God is greater than the law. And if we do less than the law, then we're just frauds. Then we don't realize that and everything we have belongs to Jesus Christ. And so when I teach it that way, and that's the bare minimum, is giving to the work of ministry the priority, one of the priorities in your life? Now, by the way, we're going to end up with the gospel today. So here we're talking about giving. I would, if, if I, listen, if I was going to pick the teaching or sermon that I would give on an invite Sunday, I would never choose this. But now, God brought you here. And then God wants to work with you because the word of God does not return void. He sends it out to accomplish its purposes because it may be that when I talk about giving, you might have a past experience hurt by a church or you might even be saying today, that's mine. And your, your, your fists are, are clenching so tight around what you think belongs to yours. Well, it might be that it does belong to you because you've yet to be bought by the blood of Jesus Christ where he pays and purchases for, for your soul and redeems you. Today might be the day of your salvation as you listen to the gospel and then you say, oh, God has been so good to me. He saved me from hell, from sin, from death. What is a few bucks? What is a tenth? What is a, what is a half? What, what would be the whole? What would be a life laid down? And when I plead with you and urge you to get involved and to be committed in your giving, I also look at verse 5. Now, I'll come, when I come to you, I pass through Macedonia, for I am passing through Macedonia. How does Paul know he's passing through Macedonia? I don't even know what I'm doing tomorrow. Well, actually, I do know what I'm doing tomorrow. I made plans in the Lord to know what I'm doing. Paul prayed, sought the Lord, this is what I'm going to be doing. Some of you just do what you're going to do because you did it last Monday. The Lord's not even involved anymore. I just, it's what I do. I get up, I do this, I do, I do whatever I want to do. And when I want to do it, then I do. No, Paul prayed. And in regards to ministry and serving and those other servants, and he's a servant and he says, I'm going to pass through Macedonia. That's, you know, modern day Greece, right across from Turkey. And it may be that I will remain or even spend the winter with you, that you may send me on my journey wherever I go. So I might come and stay with you and send you, not at my house. Is that your heart? Or is it like, oh, there's saints coming in. There's, there's people coming in to visit. We could receive them. We could, oh, they're here, to, they're here and they're, and they're going to be sent to the mission field and they're going to go serve the Lord elsewhere. Are you already praying and you already like wondering, God, what is my involvement and commitment to Luke Gerlach when he is sent to Ireland to be a missionary there and to take the gospel and to teach the baptism with the Holy Spirit when he goes to Ireland and to see people saved and come into the fullness of God. Because he's called to go to Ireland. And we as a church, I, I think some of his delay is us. Now how radical could that be that God would bring suffering into one another Christian's life to perfect the rest of the body that we would be ready to say we're ready as a church to send him out. You don't get royalties. They're not my son. So if it was my family, I just get to use your life. You don't get royalties. You chose to come here and stay. So it's on you. Now, Paul says to this church, I mean, the same thing. Paul went there, preached the gospel. They got saved through the power of the gospel, and he's the apostle to that church, and so he has this relationship with them. He says, I do not wish to see you now on the way, but I hope to stay a while with you if the Lord permits. And that's that will of God. That's that place of getting involved in the work of ministry. And Paul is saying, I want to come and spend time with you, but I'm not going to just stop by and then take off right away. I'm going to come back around on my way back through, and then I'm going to spend some time with you. He, and here's why. He says, but I will tarry in Ephesus until Pentecost. Isn't that a great word, tarrying? You know what it, just, you know what it means? I'm going I'm to go stay in Ephesus. 
I'm going to stay there as long as what's happening. Look what's happening in Ephesus. Until Pentecost. So he's got a plan. He's prayed. He Think of Pentecost for the believers in the church. What was Pentecost? Well, it was, it was a Jewish feast day, but now it became synonymous for the church. That's the day the church was birthed. That's the day the Holy Spirit came upon the church. 3,000 saved that day. Wouldn't it be great to actually see 3,000 people saved by the Holy Spirit through Christ Jesus, through the cross of Christ, by his blood in one day, all by the preaching of the gospel and the Holy Spirit does the work? Wouldn't it be awesome to see these things? Well, for him, he says, I'm standing there till Pentecost, for a great and effective door has opened to me and there are many adversaries. Megas is the uh, Greek word there, and it simply means a great door. Uh, and it's just that. It could be great in number. It could be great in effort. Hey, do you believe that you're to seek great things in the Lord? See, when you're just attending a church, all you're looking for is a place that will meet your preferences. If you're today here shopping for church like a consumer because you grew up in this Babylonian system, which we now have adapted into this culture of corporate America and all these other things that we just, I, I thought that's just what way things were. People bought and sold. No. Are you here to serve the living God and to know that he's among you and to know that he's here and to surrender your life for his service and for his kingdom? Paul says that he was. He says, I'm going to stay there till Pentecost for a great and effective door has opened to me and it's the easy life. Is that what your Bible says? What's your Bible say there in verse 9? And there are many adversaries. Think about it. Whenever there's to be a great work of God, who's going to stand there to oppose? Well, we know that Satan stands to oppose God. And so if you're going to do anything for the Lord, think of your one soul. Today, today the plea goes forth by the gospel of Jesus Christ to turn your life from darkness to light, to save your soul from sin and death to eternal life in Christ Jesus. You don't think that the many stand to oppose that? See, Paul says there's a great and effective door. Effectual. It works. God's working here. It's open. And it's, it's a great work of God and many adversaries arise. Well, in this involvement to the work of ministry, right, it isn't that we get to go and do what we want to get to go and do whenever we want to go do it. Do you really believe that you're to pray and follow and go and do those things? Do you believe that we together as church have a calling upon our life together in Christ Jesus that we may accomplish, and I'm praying for open door ministry. I'm praying for a great and effective door. So I expect what? Opposition. Expect it. So in our commitment to the will of God, look at the rest of the servants here. And if Timothy comes, Paul, right, Timothy, it's, uh, we, found his, we find his name. There's a book of the Bible written to him. Just a great thing here to read and on a side note for those of you who want to tie the scripture together. If Timothy comes, see that he may be with you without fear. Literally, literally to not be despised. To, to be with you without fear that he can move freely amongst you and he can serve the Lord freely with you. See that he may come be with you without fear for he does the work of the Lord as I also do. In fact, Paul says of Timothy, I don't have another man like Timothy. He serves with me as a son serves with his father or works with his father and he says he labors in the gospel. That's Timothy to Paul. He's sending him there. Therefore, let no one despise him but send him on his journey in peace. Literally, send him forth. You want to do the work of ministry. Sometimes the work of ministry has nothing to do with you and everything about supporting the one who goes and does what God's called him to do. Sometimes we have to push people out of here to go and do what God's called them to do. Where are the men who answer the call to go forth under the authority of the church, hands laid on them like we see in the Bible, and they go forth to do the work of God, the work of ministry? Paul lays hands on Timothy. Timothy, we were told, he received gifts of God through the laying on of hands of the presbyters, right? The elders of the church, and through Paul laying hands on him and says, Timothy, go out and do the work of ministry. You know what Paul assigned him to? Put some elders in place in these churches that got started. Find the leaders of the men and get them in place there. Same thing to Titus. See, there's a, a, a whole diversity of ministries to be had in the body of Christ. See, so many come and they see a little church and they despise a small church like they despise Timothy. And hence the warning is this to us, not to despise the days of small beginnings, but to realize that so much more can be going on and happening when we're committed to the will of God, his servants, and resisting the many adversaries. 
Therefore, let no one despise him, right? I'm waiting for him to come to me with the brethren that he may come to me. 12, now concerning our brother Apollos. Now, Apollos was used of mightily in Ephesus, right? I strongly urged him to come to you with the brethren. That's Paul's way of saying, if there's anything I could do, I would have sent him to you, right? But he was unwilling, quite unwilling to come at this time. However, he will come when he has a convenient time. Don't make it think like, like Apollos too is like, well, it's not convenient for me. I'm not going to do ministry because it's not convenient. By the way, ministry is never convenient. So if you're going to serve the Lord and you're going to work in the gospel of Jesus Christ, it's not convenient. You know, rarely do people come to church and sin in the church service where it's so convenient for me to minister unto them and restore them. Usually those calls come later at night or on the weekend or, hey, I need help with this or, oh, can you bail me out? Right? These are the things that happen in this world, getting somebody free from sin. I wonder what a great door would look like in this day and age. Now, the next section, well, we, application. We must do the Word of God, right? If we don't do the Word of God, what does that make us? Lives who build upon the sand if we're not going to hear what Jesus said and put it into practice. Here we go. What's your ministry? What's your ministry? What's your giving? Now, that does not hurt me one bit. There's no ouch. You, 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 you with me? This, this was established. This is established. I, I, I want you to say this. Establish your involvement and commitment to this body of believers. And don't think to me. Don't think to a corporation. Don't think to a denomination. Don't think, but your loyalty, don't think that it comes to them. It comes to the one another in this body of believers. I wonder how that'll look on video, right? <laughs> Look around, you guys. This, this is us. God brought us together. If you're here, you're here. You're a part of this. What's your commitment and involvement to one another? How do you serve one another in love? Ministry means serving. It, I mean, how hard can it be a servant? It must be really, really hard because it's hard to find servants. Easy to find volunteers. Hard to find servants. See, but this thing called ministry, and then what's your giving? I love this. I, I taught my kids from an early age, both. They are not, they're not like, oh, I just, I just hope one day I could possibly start giving or maybe I'll start serving. They're not even thinking like that. They just start serving and they start giving. And one of my children gets a job and says, I can't wait to start giving. All along, this child who remained nameless so I don't have to buy her dinner. <laughs> Do it. Do it. I will not be taunted from the, uh, the gallery. <laughs> But now answer that in application. What's your ministry? What's your commitment? What's your involvement? What's your giving to this body of believers? Are you just attending here and you're not a part? You're not a partaker? You're, you're not doing that? And to your visitors today, welcome. You can get, you can get involved in this. You can, today, you can surrender your life to Jesus Christ. You can get saved from your sin, be born again, and you can be immediately brought into a body of believers. And then you can get involved and you can become a servant. And we have room for serving in this body of believers. I will find a place for you, right? I'll find something that you can do in the Lord. Or else Jamie will. <laughs> hey, she said the amen. Hey, out of love, Paul writes to the church at Corinth. Out of love, I share this word with you. Now, the next section is just two verses, 13 and 14. So you look down for a little bit. It says this, watch, stand fast in the faith, be brave, be strong, let all that you do be done in love. Now stick with me, we're going to move a bit quickly through the scriptures. Okay, watch, give strict attention. Now, I want you guys to have this, if you can get this. Today, this instruction to watch, it's, it's an important thing today. You Don't lose me on the what's your ministry and what's your giving. Come to me now to, here's why. The instruction given by Paul to the church is watch, give strict attention. The outline of the biblical usage is the metaphor, give strict attention to, be cautious, be active. Don't think of watching as, ooh, I get to watch TV. I don't know where that came in. Because when you watch TV, we say veg out. I don't know what you say, right? Video games, mindless, numbless. Why is it that 35-year-old that boys want to play video games? Where are the men? Now, yes, I'm going to be pretty bold here today. T to take heed lest through remission and indolence, look that one up, some destructive calamity suddenly overtake one. See, that's why we watch. Look at Mark 13 with me. You can look up here if you want, or you can look in your... 
I love hearing the pages turn, but I'm going to start reading. You can join me. But of that day and hour, no one knows, not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but only the Father. Take heed, watch, and pray, for you do not know when the time is. It is like a man going to a far country who, who left his house and gave authority to his servants. Hmm, I wonder if those servants would be named apostles, right? Evangelists, prophets, pastors, and teachers. Huh, I wonder if that would all tie together in the Bible, and guess what it does? See, the authority granted unto the church and, and his servants, authority granted in this parable, Right. Take heed, watch, and pray. You don't know what hour. Uh, like a man going to a far country, left the house, gave authority to his servants, and to each his work, and commanded the doorkeeper to watch. Watch, therefore, for you do not know the, the, when the master of the house is coming, in the evening, at midnight, or the crowning of, crowing of the rooster, or in the morning, lest coming suddenly he find you sleeping. And what I say to you, I say to you all, Watch. Those are words of Jesus. They're in red. They come, I didn't get them in red up here, but they're in red. Jesus commanded to watch, to be attentive. Oh, there's another one for us, church. Another place to turn. Revelation 3. So you find your way there as well. Or again, I have it up here. You can look at this. And I don't, I don't ever want the screen to take away the word of God from your own personal life. I want you to have the word of God, to hear it, to see it, to know where these things are at. And to the angel of the church in Sardis, right. And to the angel in church in Fargo, right. It's, it's, it's a healthy application. These things says he who has the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. I know your works, that you have a name that you are alive, but you are dead. Be watchful and strengthen the things that, which remain that are ready to die. For I have not found your works perfect before God. Remember, therefore, how you have received and heard. Hold fast and repent. Therefore, if you will not watch, I will come upon you as a thief, and you will not know what hour will come upon you. Watch implies be ready for the Lord's return. For the Lord may return at any moment. Jesus said he didn't even know the hour. Watch, be attentive, and be steady because the Lord's coming back. Peter tells us that if we hold that in front of us and we're awake and not sleep and we're watching, guess what? We're not going to go around beating each other, fellow servants. We're not going to go around and carousing and drunkenness as believers. And we're not going to be asleep when the Lord comes. Do you really want Jesus to come back and to appear as a thief to you? Who are you? When he comes back, I want to hear the sound. I want to meet him in the air. I want to be like, I've been waiting for you. And I actually would like to take all of you with me. Think that one through about being ready together. Now, we continue this uh, uh, watch, stand fast in the faith. Absolutely, absolutely love this. Let's look at this next phrase. Stand fast in the faith. It's to persevere, to persist. How exciting. To stand firm, to keep one's standing. Hmm. I guess this is in the throwaway chapter after all. Gift of exhortation, Paul writes it down in the scriptures. Holy Spirit given to the church there applies to more than just one church, applies to all churches. And I say to you today, if you have faith in Christ Jesus, you are to be firm and stand faith in him. Philippians 1.27 declares, Only let your conduct be worthy of the gospel of Christ, so that whether I come and see, see you or am absent, I may hear of your affairs, that you stand fast in one spirit, with one mind striving together for the faith of the gospel. Pretty good word there, isn't it? Philippians 4.1 declares, Therefore, my beloved and longed for brethren, my joy and my crown. Therefore, my beloved people in the church that I get to pastor. What a privilege it is to shepherd this flock of God that's among me. Right? My longed for brethren. If you knew that phrase. How much I long for each and every one of you in your walk and relationship with the Lord. So stand fast in the Lord, beloved. That communicates to us, doesn't it? Be brave. Hmm. Well, the King James says, quit you like men. I like that better. Because then I had to go look it up. Be brave, and then you, like, you might be singing a song, or you might be thinking of some kind of thing you saw, something else, somewhere else other than Scripture, then to really understand, what's the Holy Spirit saying to us? What's he saying? Well, this, this word here, right? The outline of the biblical usage of this word is to make a man... To make a man of or to make brave? To show oneself a man, be brave. Now, I'm not talking to the ladies to be men. That's a whole other twisted lie that's floating through. I'm talking the men, be men. Right? Be godly men. Now, with this, okay, 
got a word for you. Man, you listening? Ladies, you can, you can go to your happy place for a bit. <laughs> Unless you're married and then you got to remind your husband of what I said. <laughs> right? And you can be a faithful wife. That here's what he said. <laughs> Whoever told you to get in touch with your feminine side? <laughs> Whoever told you that? <laughs> Whoever told you that? Was it Satan? Are you receiving your image of what a, 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 a man is from TV? You remember that bumbling idiot of a, of a tool man who couldn't get anything right and, right and his wife was out working and he was playing all day long and had a TV show. See, you understand that what we receive by way of image of what's a man should derive out of the scriptures. What does Paul say to these guys? You quit yourselves like men. You be a man. Well, what's a man? We should, we should almost have an entire Bible to know what a man is. It's in there. It's in there what a man of God is commanded unto and what he's to do and how he's to live. And there's a great man to follow named Jesus Christ of Nazareth. You want to know what it is to be a man, you want it is to be a servant, to lay down life, to love, to serve, to be filled with compassion, to be filled with the power of God, to pray, to, to answer, and to go forth in this world and be salt and light. There's a man to follow. People try to re-envision Jesus as a feminine man. The painters paint him feminine. <laughs> Whoever said this? Let women be women, let men be men. Now look at this here in the scriptures. Here's 1 Samuel 4, 9. Now it's of the Philistines, the, the heathens, the pagans. So even the heathens and the pagans get this. Be strong, conduct yourselves like men, you Philistines, that you do not become servants of the Hebrews as they have been to you. Conduct yourselves like men and fight. Here's 2 Samuel 10, 12 out of the King James. Be of good courage and let us play the men for our people. Now, it doesn't mean pretend. That word there is, let's be men for our people and for the cities of our God and the Lord do that which seems good to him. We did counterterrorism training when we were in Israel with one of the, one of the prime trainers of, of the, the IDF and the, and the national police in Israel. And they gave us a little tourist training and we got certificates for it. But our trainer was the real deal. He talked about his weapon. He talked about the fear of, of holding that and, and what it took to be like men to defend their country. He says, I, I don't have a problem. I don't have an identity crisis. I don't have to run all over the world to try to defend the world. I'm not, I said, I'm here to, to defend my people and, and my nation. He says, and we as Israel, he says, we don't take refugees. We don't take men. We'll take your women and children. You get, you get arms and you fight for your country and when you win your country, you can have your women and children back. You know, where's the church today that will quit you like men? Why is it that churches catered to the women and handed over the ministry to the women because where were the men? Quit yourselves, be like men, and here's my word for you from Ephesians 6. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in all the evil day, having done all to stand. Stand therefore, having girded your waist with truth, having put on the breastplate of righteousness, and having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Above all, taking the shield of faith with which you'll be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one and take the helmet of salvation, the sword of the spirit, which is the word, and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. Quit yourselves like men. Stop whining and complaining. Stop saying, I don't want to. <laughs> and be a man. Now, I love you guys. And, and, I don't like what this culture produces. This culture produces men-shaped bodies, but boys who want to marry their mothers, so they'll take care of all their needs, who will provide for him. Now, I, I really love the Word of God. I really, I really had to repent to the Word of God. I don't know if you understand this. I read my Bible, believed what it said, and begged God to change this heart that I would repent according to the Scriptures and that I would be a man. And when I stand up here and say this and proclaim this boldly today, I want the church to be for men and women. Do you understand that? There is so much room in the body of Christ to experience the fullness of let men be men, let women be women. Let's serve the Lord together. Let's fulfill what God's called us to do. Fight the good fight of faith. Lay hold on eternal life to which you were also called and have confessed the good confession in the presence of many witnesses. 1 Timothy 6.12. Paul even told Timothy to be a man. Be strong. I like this. King James says, be strong. So you, you see this. Be strong. 
Well, outline of biblical usage, to strengthen, to make strong, to be made strong, to increase in strength, to grow strong. Hmm. Straightforward? I like strong men. Right? Guys, I despise wimpy men. They'll change here. Right? Oh, they'll leave me. Right? But have you received your estimation of what a man is to be from this culture? Or have you received this from the Word of God and you've repented? Now, I've got a couple men in here say, like, teach me to be a man of God. Show me those things. Get in your Bible. Read. Pray. Show up. Here's Ephesians 3.16. That he would grant you according to the riches of his glory to be strengthened with might through his spirit in the inner man. Joshua 1.9. Have I not commanded you, be strong and of good courage. Do not be afraid nor be dismayed, for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. 1 Kings 2.2. 2. I go the way of all the earth. Be strong, therefore, and prove yourself a man. Prove yourself a godly man. Now, I don't know if we'll ever have men of God, or like, you know, Moses was a man of God. Jesus is the Son of God. But we certainly can have what? Godly men. Godly women. Right? Guys, if you take care of yourself, and then you can take care of your wife, and, and if you're a, a woman here and you're single, you have a covering in this body of Christ. There's spiritual authority. You're protected. You're covered. You have room and freedom to serve. And man, do we need servants. Man, do we need people to minister and, and care for these things. Haggai 2.4. Yet now be strong, Zerubbabel, says the Lord, and be strong, Joshua, son of Jehozadak, the high priest, and be strong. Hmm, get the point? All you people of the land, says the Lord, and work, for I am with you, says the Lord of hosts. 2 Corinthians 12, 9. And he said to me, My grace is sufficient for you, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Therefore... Most gladly, I will rather boast in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. So this isn't posing in the mirror with your muscles saying, I'm strong. <laughs> this is what? On your knees in weakness saying, Father, help. Lord, we need you. You know that a, that a strong man is pretty much on his knees. So you understand in this weakness, and Paul's crying out to the Lord, he says, therefore I take pleasure in infirmities. That's backwards, by the way, to this culture. Taking pleasure in your weaknesses? Hey, what do, what do men boast about today? They lie about their accomplishments. Trust me, I've been the hero of every story I tried to tell. I'm just not that good of a storyteller. <laughs> but do we really boast in our infirmities and say, you know what? I used to be a sinner. Jesus saved me. Man, this weakness. I, I really blew it this week, but God is good. I mean, do we really boast in our infirmities and say, I am nothing, he is everything? In reproaches, in needs, in persecutions, in distresses, for Christ's sake, for when I am weak, then I am strong. Finally, my brethren, hey, this is not the end of the sermon, right? <laughs> Ephesians 6.10. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord, the power of his might. Timothy, you therefore my son, 2 Timothy 2.1, you therefore my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. Now, I want to impress you. Let's see if I got it in my notes. I probably can't even impress you. Did I write it down anywhere? All these exhortations come in the imperative mood when you look at verbs. Impressive, huh? Okay, very good. <laughs> two times two equals two. Seven times four equals 28. Okay, very good. Same helps you have. You look it up. It's in the imperative mood. You know what this means? This is a, these are all commands given under the authority of the strength in which the command was given. Watch. Stand fast. So if you consider yourself as one under authority and you consider this your church, I command you to watch. I command you to stand fast in the faith. I command you to, to um, be strong. I command you to be men. Right? Paul wrote it down. Jesus told us to watch. Do you, you starting to get this flavor? Where did these commands come from? Hey, if I'm just up here talking man's word, run away. But if this is God's word, and you're, you're hearing God's word, and, and the command comes from God through his word, and, and the commands come, well, quit yourselves and be like men. These are New Testament commandments. All things to be done with love. Hmm. 
I don't need to expand on love because everybody's got that covered. <laughs> First Corinthians 13, love is long-suffering, right? Love is kind, does not boast, right? It's, you, you know, do you know it well enough yet? Do you know enough to know that this is God's love and we're not loving people? Do you know enough to know that you need God's love? If only there was a command somewhere, maybe John 13, 34, and 35, maybe, maybe Jesus, maybe not the guy up front, maybe not the guy with the, with the, the funny haircut and can't shave, right? Maybe that guy up front doesn't know anything, but maybe Jesus does. John 13, 34, a new commandment I give to you, that you love one another as I have loved you, and that you also love one another. By this, all will know that you're my disciples if you have love for one another. Now, this didn't make the notes, but it's going to make the sermon. There's no conflict between being a strong man, being brave and courageous, and fighting for your faith, and being a man of love. Because love is not emotion. Love is a commitment. Love is life laid down. Love is a decision. Love is the cross of Jesus Christ for you. And when you have this, and you put it into place, and, and here's our application. I thought it would be some glorious application after being a man. It is. It is. You boil down all the prayers you ever prayed, and isn't, isn't this the one you want to answer? Father in heaven, make me more like Jesus. So I pray for you. I say make us more like Jesus. More compassionate, more of a servant, more loving, more of a man, right? Ladies, more of a woman of God, right? Men, more of a man of God. I don't know if we'll ever get there, but we can be godly and we can be righteous, godly men and women. All right. I love the Bible. This is awesome. Verse 15. <laughs> I urge you, brethren and sistren, right? I urge you, brethren, that you know the household of Stephanus, that it is the first fruits of Achaia, the first ones who got saved there, and that they have devoted themselves to ministry of the saints, that you also submit to such and to everyone who works and labors with us. I am glad about the coming of Stephanus, Fortunatus, and Achaeus. For what was lacking on your part, they supplied, for they refreshed my spirit and yours. Therefore, acknowledge such men. The churches of Asia greet you, Aquila and Priscilla greet you, heartily in the Lord with the church that is in their house. Now, this whole thing I'm talking to you today about being involved and committed and serving in love, this is the church you belong to. You don't like this church because of how I teach the Bible up here today. Please find a church where you can fulfill being church. My heart is for you that you would have the Word of God. I, if you can find a better gig where someone's going to love you and teach the Bible more to you than I do, go find it. But I'll, I'll just lay it out there that I believe in the Word of God and love the Word of God, and I'll lay down my life for you, and I already do. Even before I know you and you walk in the door, you're loved by Jesus Christ. Devoted themselves to the ministry and church. That's the first fruits. They did this. Listen, they ordered under authority. They became addicted to the ministry and the authority that God gave them to do it. Free from the addictions of this world, but addicted themselves to the ministry. Submit yourself under this authority in church and work and serve. Get to it. Listen, if you cannot submit, right, if you cannot place yourself under authority in a ministry or under the ministry of this church, you will only cause problems. Don't think parachurch is under authority of the church. That's a modern idea that removes the authority of the structure because God gave to the church apostles, prophets, evangelists, and pastors and teachers for the equipping of the saints. The authority granted is you are to place yourself under authority, and authority is not just submitting when something happens you don't like. Authority happens every single day when you place yourself under the order which God has given to you for your protection, but for the work of ministry in church. Joy of serving in the ministry. If you don't submit, joy is all gone. What is submission? Well, this group, honor those that place themselves under, acknowledge those serving and refreshing the church. Don't just attend the church. Be the church. We should almost have a sound clip. Don't just attend a church. Be the church. 
just because all the modern lines are blurred in men and women and all the modern lines are, are blurred as far as like can a woman pastor or not all the modern lines are blurred all the culturisms have brought in and the cultures change the word of God I say restore the word of God you go into this culture and you speak the truth and why you live the way you live and how you live go be the church go live that out all good things must come to an end so it is 1 Corinthians, verse 20. All the brethren greet you, right? Okay, 21. The salutation with my own hand, Paul's. So he would speak the letter, somebody would write it down, and now he says, here's my signature. So salutation, the greeting, that same greeting heartily in the Lord. Holy kiss, well, how about a hug, right? And then embrace. Culture had influenced, right? So let's greet one another. So here Paul says, if anyone does not love the Lord Jesus Christ, and here's where I want to talk to you today, you come into the room and you're not yet saved, you, you haven't believed on Jesus Christ, you're not forgiven, you haven't repented, I want to talk to you about this. Paul says, if anyone does not love the Lord Jesus Christ, let him be accursed. O Lord, come. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. My love be with you all in Christ Jesus. That word there, accursed, in the King James is anathema. It means to be, to be separated from God. It's to be the curse. In the, in the context of when the priest would lay his hands on the sacrifice for sin, he would transfer the sin to that animal for sacrifice, and that animal was now the sacrifice. That animal was anathema. It was going to the altar to die. Jesus became a curse for us. Jesus, Jesus became anathema for you and that he went to the cross to die for your sin to save you from your sin and how do you know it took if you can handle that how do you know it worked he rose again from the dead sacrifice acceptable he was anathema and now what do you say if anyone does not love the Lord Jesus Christ let him be accursed let him be anathema and then he says Maranatha in the King James O Lord come what an incredible place I've brought you to here because I, you know, I just went right through the scriptures. Amazing, huh? We start out with giving. We start out with serving, commitment, involvement in church. Today, you're not part of church because you haven't been saved. Trust me, to be in church, you have to be saved from above. You must be born again. You must be regenerated. If you don't love the Lord Jesus Christ, that means you've never been saved by him. Because once you realize what he does for you on the cross to forgive your sins, you can't help but honestly say to what? I love the Lord Jesus Christ for what he's done for me. You need to be saved today? Well, let's talk a little bit about this anathema, right? Specifically, the offering resulting from a vow, a thing devoted to God without hope of being redeemed, and if an animal to be slain, therefore a person doomed to destruction. If you do not love the Lord Jesus Christ, you're doomed to spiritual destruction, right? Tormented in eternity for hell, in hell for eternity. Probably for eternity in hell, too, and, right? <laughs> Judgment of God upon sin. God's righteous and holy. I plead with you, don't go there. A man accursed, right? Therefore I make known to you that no one speaking by the Spirit of God calls Jesus accursed, and no one can say that Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. So what am I saying? When he became the sacrifice for sin, I'm not saying he was accursed and dead forever. I said, no, God chose him, and God put it that way, that he would die and he'd rise again. He's alive. The resurrection is key. If anyone does not love the Lord, let him be accursed. Here's Galatians 1.8. But even if we are an angel from heaven preach any other gospel to you than what you have what we have preached, let him be accursed. As we have said before, so now I say again, if anyone preaches to you another gospel, to you than what you've received, let him be accursed. Well, in order for me to have this be true of everyone here today, that grace and love would be to you, and here's the application. Before you today is, is this choice. I present to you the opportunity, if you have not been born from above, if you've never received forgiveness of sin from Jesus Christ and you're not saved, and you know that if you died today, you would be accursed because your sin has not been forgiven by Jesus Christ on the cross, and you know in your heart that you're an enemy of God, and that's you that I'm talking to you, today is the day of salvation. How can I receive this salvation? What do I have to do? What kind of works do I have to do to get this? And the answer is, you need to bow your knee and humble yourself before Almighty God who sees your heart and ask Him to save you through Christ Jesus, that you'd be saved from the penalty of your sin, that you'd be saved from death because sin produces death. Now I'm guessing you want that today. 
here I am today in Maranatha. I can't wait for the Lord to come back. Oh, Lord, come. Those are my prayers. Jesus, come. Come and rule and reign here. Come, rapture the church. Come, rescue the church. You want to be a part of that? You want to be involved and committed and serving in love here? First and foremost, you must be saved. If I've talked to you and I ask you the question, do you know the Lord? Do you know the Lord Jesus? Have you been born from above? And you can't answer that. Now you can. Here's how you answer it. Will you pray with me? If this is you, just pray in your heart to God. He hears you. If you need prayer, right, I'll, I'll pray with you. But let's wrap up the service here in opportunity. Father in heaven, I confess that I'm a sinner. And I pray today asking that you would forgive my sin. Everything I've ever did wrong against you, God, you forgive my sin through the power of the blood of the cross of Jesus Christ where he gave his life to forgive sin. And I seek forgiveness and I seek to be saved. And Father, I know that you are faithful and just through Christ Jesus to forgive sin when, when I confess sin. And so Lord, I, I now ask to be forgiven and I ask to receive eternal life in Christ Jesus as I repent from my ways and turn to you. In Jesus' name, amen.